so in this last session, uh, let us discuss a few points about time and stress management. Let us look at some basic principles of time management and then application of these for research. Sometimes time management is referred to as the art of doing the right things and doing things right. So what are the right things that one must do in research? These we have listed so far. Now question is how do you do them right? So doing things right involves the following. That is first planning which involves a to-do list. Then prioritizing which of the things are important and urgent and then scheduling. So difficult things during peak hours. Now this art of doing things right and planning, prioritizing and scheduling can be nicely illustrated with the help of an analogy. Now imagine that you have a beaker in which uh, you have to put uh, sand and stone. You have to fill the beaker with sand and stone. And you would like to fill in as many stones and as much sand as possible. So what is the way you would do it? Will you first put the sand and then put the stones? Well, if you did that, uh, the space between the stones, because all the stones are of, not of the same size and shape, will be wasted. <coughs> Okay, so a better approach is you first fill in the stones which are big and then you put the sand okay, or the smaller particles. In this manner you can uh, fill as much as possible within the same volume. Now this is basically the philosophy behind doing things right, prioritizing, which things to do first and which things to do in between important things. Okay? Now we have already said uh, sometime during our uh, previous uh, hours that you need a change because you need to work continuously on an idea for a long time. What you need to do is occasionally you need time for refreshing. So this refreshing things, um, activities which uh, help you to refresh are some small jobs, routine jobs, so which should be put in between some important activities in which you require to do a lot of thinking. Let us also look at time pressure which uh, all of us experience. This equation time pressure is a function of internal factors. <coughs> it is very important. Often we blame the external situation for time pressure but mainly it is because of internal factor. So the time pressure is proportional to our resistance to what we are doing. The internal factors are improper attitudes and confusion about goals and values. So if you do not like something then the uh, <coughs> time pressure on you will be more for doing the job. Also if you are not approaching with the right attitude. So what is the right attitude? We will uh, give some hints towards the end of this lecture. Now in research we cannot say that go and discover the second law of thermodynamics in the afternoon. You can't set aside time for uh, generating ideas and so on, specific times of the day. But if we are able to arrange our schedule so as to set aside time for thinking and experimenting, we put ourselves in the way of discovering something. So working out a new idea requires much routine work and this part of an investigation and to this part of an investigation we can apply efficiency methods. So as far as uh, thinking about new ideas, finding problems, finding solutions and so on, right? you cannot say that this can will be done at the, in this time of the day. So you must be continuously thinking about it. right? More than this you cannot say much. But supposing uh, you have found a problem and you also got an idea of how to go about solving it. 
then there is a lot of routine work to be done before you get the results. Now, for this routine work, you can apply the uh, so-called efficiency methods. Okay, so scheduling and so on that we discussed just now, the time management principles. See, one important uh, um, quotation: "Make hay while the sun shines." So, moment you get an idea. Right, you must immediately start working on it and try to finish the job. This is very important. This is what is the meaning of make hay while the sun shines. Many times, what happens with uh, students is they get an idea and then they are thrilled that we have got an idea and then they want to do several other things because they are already excited and they feel you know they have already achieved something significant. And after some time, they start working on it and then finishing it, right? Thinking that you know now. Uh, it's only a matter of time. You just uh, work on it some time and then it will be over. No, that is not correct. You are writing a paper. Don't go on writing a paper for months. Right? You start writing a paper when your uh, idea is sufficiently clear and you have got some significant results. You just spend all your time in writing up. Okay? That is the way you should work. This is what is the meaning of make hay while the sun shines. And after the thing is done, if you want a break, you can take a break, even a longer break. Right? But don't think of working only for two, three hours a day. That kind of thing is not good. Set deadlines. They motivate and create the necessary pressure to get work. So you should have deadlines. Supposing you have started writing a paper, you decide. After 15 days, I will submit it. Right? That is my deadline. So this sort of uh, deadline should be um, there and this is where the supervisor also can help. A few points about stress. See, stress and fatigue dull our fa faculties and prevent us from doing our best. This is one fact. But there is also another fact. Stress is not always bad. Example, this course is an outcome of stress. So, for example, it is because I underwent stress during my PhD, I thought something should be done to reduce the stress. And so, you know, I thought I should be doing some course like this. Few people work without pressure. So, uh, some amount of stress or pressure is good for learning. But too much is not good. Now, what are the sources of stress for research scholars? First important source of stress is monotony and repetitiveness of concentrating on the same idea for an extended period of time. We have said this any number of times. This is the main uh, characteristic of research. So, solution is alternate working, standing, sitting, moving and reading to keep fresh. Then major source of stress is related to relationships. Strained relation between guide and the student this is another major source of stress. So, this one point we will discuss in little bit detail. Right? How to avoid or minimize this strain. Criticism. Another source of stress that a uh, research scholar encounters is when a paper is rejected. Very first paper when it is rejected, then you are down. Okay? This is one example of criticism. Or you are uh, doing something very enthusiastically and you have spent three or four months. And at the end of that, you meet somebody who says, hey, this is uh, not important at all. Why are you spending so much time on this? So this kind of situation research scholars encounter often. So they must learn to deal with criticism. This is very, very important. And you should not get uh, um, unduly perturbed or disturbed because of criticism. It affects your relationships also. In fact, uh, studies have shown how authors respond to rejection. There are books which have come out with all these facts about research and teaching, right? So, editor's experiences in uh, doing research, then uh, compilation of how authors respond to rejection of papers and so on. So, they have found no author is happy with rejection, right? It is always the case, number one. But number two, very interesting thing. All authors feel that the comments of reviewers, negative comments of reviewers are unfair the first time when they see the rejection or the negative comment, they feel it is unfair. 
they all most of the authors have recorded that this is what they do. Third important thing, but when they take a look at the review after a few days, then they see yeah there may be some point in you know what the reviewer is saying, and when they look at the review after 15 days or a month, then they feel yeah the reviewer is right, okay, he has a point, and only then you start uh, working on it. So that is why it is suggested whenever you get a review, particularly a negative one, right? Don't go about uh, trying to write an answer or a response immediately because you will not be in a state to see things objectively. See, so what is the way you should deal with the criticism? Okay, I mean, don't try to respond to it immediately with an impulse. So this is the point. You give some time and then you develop a response. Deadlines set by supervisors. This is one more source of stress. But then, as we have said, deadlines are important because otherwise you won't work. Cyclical changes in emotional states. You know, when you have prolonged working on the same thing. And of course, this last thing is also important. People get involved in romantic affairs. This uh, this is based on research, right? So best avoid it. Don't want to discuss further on it because as a guide. People will be interested in the, the research output. Whatever may be the interest of the students. Uh, so let us look at the uh, phases in which a research scholar goes through. Lack of awareness of psychological phases of PhD is one more reason for the stress. So here, a few things have been listed based on research on a large number of PhD students. These are the stages in which the students broadly uh, undergo. Okay, so first enthusiasm. Right, you have uh, just joined a research program and all very enthusiastic. You want to do some great work and so on. You will do this. You will do that and all. But then after some time, as we have discussed, uh, you find things are not working. Self doubt. Whether I don't know whether I'm cut out for research. Right? How is it that simple things I don't seem to be able to do, and so on. Therefore, it results in isolation. Moment you get into self doubt and this kind of things, difficulties, then you tend to isolate. Okay, because you may not like to tell this to other people that you know I feel uh, somehow that I don't feel I'm cut out for research and so on. So negative uh, emotions if you get into. But then you come out of isolation because you know I mean you have to uh, do a PhD, and then you develop interest in work. So this is like a cyclical change, right? This is how it happens. You will also develop increasing interest in work because, after all, uh, if you work in something for some time beyond a certain uh, cut-off period, you will start getting some results, right? If you press, go on. If you just determination, that is why we have emphasized several times that determination is the very very important thing for research, right? You must persist, and as you persist, some time you will start getting results. So that is how then you develop interest in the work. And as your work is progressing, then you do not meet your supervisor very often. So reduction of dependence on supervisor. But when you do it for a very long time, maybe three years and so on, because you have been doing the same thing, a boredom sets in. So it is found that towards the end of the PhD, boredom, frustration, and a job to be somehow finished is the kind of feeling that people get, even those who join research with great enthusiasm. So uh, these things. If you find yourself undergoing, you should not feel that you are unique. This is what most people experience. So, if you know this, then your stress levels hopefully will be lower. Now, oh, we have said that uh, interpersonal relations is one more reason for stress. So, look at that point for a few minutes. Now, here is a quotation. बंबई की भीड़ में हर आदमी अकेला है, right? There is a statement by a research scholar, very interesting statement. I work alone in a lab, full of people, all working alone. In fact, um, all of us have seen this in among our own students. I have seen examples of students who work on adjacent computers for months. But they will not know what the other person is doing. Each will not know what the other person is doing. They will go for tea. Sometimes they will chat, but not about research. Research is an intensive process which requires the development of social apart from academic skills. 
So, this point we must uh, remember. Now, uh, let us discuss in detail the relation between guide and student. There should be a match between the natures of the scholar and the guide and an agreement on how to work. Now, what are the kind of mismatches which can be present? Example, the student is independent minded. He wants to learn things by himself and wants time for trial and error. Okay, this is the nature of the student, suppose. Whereas, the guide's nature is that at frequent intervals, he would like to see whether there is any progress or not. Now, this is an example of a mismatch. So, the guide will keep asking the student every week, hey, what is happening, tell me. Right? And the student is not able to tell. Then the guide says, hey, you do, this is what you do. Right? And show me, next time when you come, you please show me this. Whereas, the student is already involved in something on his own and he feels he wants to test out his ideas. Right? And he is not able to shift his attention and do what the guide says. So, this is one kind of mismatch. The reverse kind, where the guide would like to give freedom to the student to develop on his or on her own trial and error and then come up with ideas and so on and discuss only after the idea has developed up to some point. Okay? So, the guide expects that the student work a lot on one's own and only after uh, things have developed up to some point, then only the, you know he would like to have a discussion. But the student's nature is that he prefers an arrangement where the guide tells him, sir, you tell me, give me short, you know, pieces of, uh, small pieces of work, right? And I will show you every week, right? Next week you do this, come with this, prepare this figure, come with this, take these readings, you know, come back to me with this. This is the kind of thing the student is very happy about. He does not want to do and think everything on, on one's own and trial and error and so on is frightening for the student. This is another nature of the student. So, this is another mismatch. So, uh, these kind of mismatches uh, create the problem. So, just as it is important for the guide to understand the nature of the student, so this itself will take some time. right? The student also should make effort to understand the guide. This is very, very important. Okay? Now, that is where uh, the second point, some want to guide people, we are talking about the nature of the guide. Some guides want to guide people to become independent researchers, whereas others want them as efficient research assistants. In particular, nowadays when uh, there is this uh, trend for building large groups, okay? so guide has a large number of students and many projects to work on. In all these cases, the projects have some deadlines. Okay? So, guide may prefer to have students who carry out whatever he wants. Right? So, he wants people as efficient research assistants, extension, right? they are hands for the uh, guide. Because he would like to see that the project you know, moves to some, uh, moves uh, at a proper pace. So, you should see if you are in an environment where this is the picture, right, where the guide is involved in a lot of projects and so on, then it is likely that the guide would be happier if you act like a good research assistant rather than be too independent minded. Okay? On the other hand, if you see uh, some guide with few students, then it is likely that the guide is expecting the students to work on one's own. Okay? And if the guide is not working on too many projects and so on, projects uh, by projects I mean you apply to the sponsoring agency and the sponsoring agency gives you money and then you have to show some results in some time frame. Right? This is a working project. So, this uh, you must uh, see the environment and see, you will see your guide and avoid this kind of you know problems, the mismatches. So, some adjustment will have to be made from your side also. Now, here uh, an important thing to note is that it is not necessary that you should do earth shaking research in PhD itself. This can be a problem with many students who are very enthusiastic, right? Who want to do great work. They are inspired by, you know, Einstein did something earth shaking, Newton did this and so on. Why not I also be like that? It's very good a spirit. But what you should note is, for example, the 
best of work of Einstein didn't happen during his PhD, the work for which he is known for. Many such examples can be given, right? Karl Marx is known for his work, Das Kapital. That is not his PhD thesis. That he has done later. So this is an important point to note. Just because your PhD is not very earth shaking doesn't mean that that is the uh, you know ultimate that you can do. See later on you can flower and you can do very good work. So this is also an important point that the student should note. So a few points about ethics. Research like uh, all good things in life is never smooth sailing. And this is where the problem is there. So when things are not smooth sailing, you want to take shortcuts. Okay? This is where unethical conduct is likely. So I am discussing the uh, only the key uh, areas where people behave unethically. Report observation truthfully. This is one area where many people have a tendency to fudge. In fact, I can give a quote and uh, experience of my own. Once I asked my student to take um, several measurements. Uh, to take those measurements, he spent about a month. And then I asked him to plot those readings and come to me with you know, the plots. I found that the plots look very regular. I was really surprised. I mean, how can so many readings uh, you know, be regular? Fall, show such a regular pattern. Then when I asked him, he said, no sir, actually several points were not fitting into this picture, so I simply removed them. Okay? So this is something very common. Or people try to uh, you know, take readings again and again until things fit into a pattern. Right? So you take a set of readings, you know, it, it's not good. So you go on taking more readings. Okay? Now here I am not saying that you should not perfect your experiment. In the beginning you may have an apparatus which is not giving you readings properly and so on. That is different. You know, improving the experiment is not what I am talking about. But after all, we have seen that every measurement has random and systematic errors. So, if you think that you will make the errors zero, this is not possible. You can minimize errors, but you must report readings truthfully. Because as we have seen in some case, the fact that the uh, behavior is not regular itself is uh, a finding, right? Under some situations, you are not able to predict the behavior. This itself is a finding. So this is very important. Plagiarism. This is the next uh, important unethical conduct. People do not cite references. They do not cite uh, from where they have got the ideas. And nowadays, the main thing is. The project reports are simply cut paste. We have seen so many such instances in our own uh, department, where uh, students have been asked to rewrite their whole thesis, okay, because it was simply cut and paste. I am not talking about PhD thesis, uh, M Tech, MS, and so on at that stage. But in institutions other than IIT, they have seen even PhD thesis being prepared like that. Just from different sources, you take and put it all together, and then you know it becomes. So this is. Uh, no, simply not acceptable. In fact, uh, nowadays some journals that uh, at least I review for have clearly given uh, instructions to reviewers that one of the reasons for rejection of papers is improper references. Okay, and they have also uh, brought it out in editorials that uh, one of the criteria for giving an award for a paper would be proper referencing. Okay. And one of the reasons for acceptance also is proper. If you referencing is not proper, the paper can be rejected. Then, so you must give credit to co-workers and authorship and acknowledgement. This is very important. Now, a few points about uh, authorship. What should be the ordering of the authors in a paper? Although uh, some differences of views exist. By and large, it is uh, accepted that whoever is the first author is the primary contributor. In some cases, the last author is regarded as the person leading the group. If there are se several authors, then the last author is supposed to be one who is kind of leading the group, the senior most author. Now, it is not necessary that uh, 
the student's name should always come first in the publication. This is a student should know. Right? So it is not like the research work is not like a first or second standard ch uh, children doing their project. Most of these projects are done by the mothers or fathers, right? The first and second standard students, these are well known. The student is just sitting there. So uh, the teacher gives a project, this is to be done. The, you take the child and uh, go and buy things and all, bring, cut, paste, do all that, and then it is done. The student is, uh, the son or the daughter is very happy and the project is done. Okay? This is what it happens at first or second. No, but this is not the way a research is to be done, right? Because by that time you are supposed to be doing things on your own. You are responsible for what is being done. So unless uh, you have really made a contribution significantly, it is not necessary that your name should come first in the paper. Because progressively as we have said, the research education blurs the distinction between the mentor and the student. In that situation, um, the ordering of the authorship authors should correctly reflect the relative contributions. What are the uh, problems if this is not followed? Now supposing a student has not made really good contributions, but he has several papers with first author. Now it will create an impression that the student is really good and he has done the entire work. Based on this, he may be given a position somewhere. But unfortunately, that is not his capability. Now he will build a group in which he may encounter some juniors who are much capable than he is. And now this is, there is going to be a problem. Okay? A reverse is also true. If the student has done a lot of work, but if the guide is not uh, acknowledging it properly and guide puts the name first, then uh, of course we know the impact. The student will get demotivated and he will not pursue research. Okay? So that is the other side. So this authorship and so on, it is very important to acknowledge the contributions properly. So now we have a few concluding remarks. No procedure, technique, skill, ETC, which is relevant to your thesis should be exercised by you there for the first time. I am repeating what I have said earlier. You should have practiced it beforehand on a non-thesis exercise, which is therefore going to be less stressful and allow you greater learning. So writing, oral presentation, all these things you must practice. And also, we have given also uh, various methods of improving your thinking. So you can be doing all those things, right? What are the kind of things you should read? I have given you some, uh, some hints. These are the, what kind of things you must be reading. And also, you should be periodically doing some exercises, mental exercises and so on. You find puzzles and things like that. It helps to keep your mind agile. Persistence and the ability to manage boredom and frustration is very important for PhD work. Skills aren't enough. It is your attitude that makes a difference. We made this point um, in the sources of stress, improper attitude. So what is the right attitude? First important thing, if you can't do what you like, like what you do. If you can't do what you like, you like what you do. This is possible. Okay. Follow no one, but learn from everyone and acknowledge it too. This is a very nice guiding principle for research scholars. If you want to do something new, you cannot be a follower. But at the same time, it is not as though whatever you have thought of, you have thought of in vacuum. As we pointed out in our discussion also, that you know you are standing on others' shoulders, which means you are learning from others, though you may not be following others. right? You may be learning, you are learning from, not you may be, you are learning from others. So you should be willing to learn from everyone, though you may not follow any single person or a single way of doing things. And you must also acknowledge it, that you have learned okay, from uh, others. <coughs> Unhappiness is often caused by unjust comparison. What are the examples of unjust comparison in the context of Research. My friend has got a publication within the first year. But even two years down the line, I don't have a publication. Okay? 
So I start comparing. Then I feel maybe I think I should have, see my student, uh, my, my friend, he is doing theoretical work, right? So I think this must be the problem with all uh, experimental work that, you know, it takes a longer time. I think I should not have taken experimental work. I should have done theoretical work. This is not a correct comparison because even in theoretical work, people may not be able to get a publication very soon. And the other way also it can happen. So you can find, you may find that someone who is doing experimental work, the apparatus is set up by a previous student and so on and your job is to get readings and you may get a publication very soon. But your friend does not get a publication. As we have said right in the beginning, the research is full of uncertainty. This is the nature of research. Okay? So you should be careful in comparison. You also cannot compare number of papers that X has uh, written for his PhD and number of papers that you have got. Okay, this is also not a good comparison. Particularly, uh, outputs in short durations are not good guides for comparison, okay? good measures of comparison. So if you take uh, what has a person done over a period of 10 years, maybe loosely you know, it is possible to compare. But even then, the areas different people are working on are different. The problems that people are addressing are different. We have said this right in the beginning. So to be careful while comparing with others. Then repeated failures. This is a statement of an inventor. Results, why man? I have got lots of results. If I find 10,000 ways something won't work, I haven't failed. I am not discouraged because every wrong attempt discarded is just one more step forward. So if you are repeatedly encountering failures, in fact, it means you are progressing towards the correct solution. Many times we avoid asking questions or doubts. When you ask a foolish question, you remain a fool for a few minutes. If you do not ask it, you remain a fool forever. Okay? So it is your choice. It is always good to ask questions whenever they arise in your mind. Uh, finally, uh, be a vidyarthi and not a parikshartha. You know, who is a parikshartha? A person who works only for the exams, a day before the exams. And many students, in fact, they feel they are very smart that by working just one day before the exam, they are scoring very high marks. Whereas they find someone else logging it out and not scoring, right? So you look upon them and then you can laugh at them and so on. But this kind of an attitude doesn't work in research. So unless you are really a vidyarthi, that is you are after the knowledge, uh, you cannot do good research. The importance of teaching for research scholars if they involve in some teaching, tutorial, this kind of activity. So a student completes one fourth of his learning when he hears his teacher, half of his learning when he questions his teacher to clear his doubts, three fourth of the learning when he reflects himself on the knowledge he has gained, and finally his learning is complete when he teaches what he has learned himself to others. So uh, research scholars will benefit a lot if they get involved in teaching and tutorial and so on. Okay, they should not regard these activities as something which are diversions from their research. They will complement their efforts. Now a few pitfalls. First pitfall, infatuation in a topic without adequate background. Next pitfall, systematic step-by-step -step approach of completing all coursework first then doing the literature survey and then embarking on problem finding and formulation. Many times research scholars think this is a step by step process. First I want to complete all my coursework, right? So I don't bother about the problem that I am going to work on and so on. Then there is some phase in which I do extensive reading and only reading. So you are seen in the library and what are you doing? I am doing literature survey, that's all. And then you start doing your research. This is not the way it works. Actually you should be interested in finding a problem and uh, thinking about what kind of problem you will pursue for research and so on from day one when you are registered for PhD. Simultaneously you are doing the coursework. So you are doing coursework, you are doing literature survey for finding a problem and so on. You are thinking about your research along with the coursework. This is the correct approach. Third pitfall, I have, if I have stumbled upon a good problem by God's or guide's grace early in my research, rather than rushing into a solution and early thesis submission, I can take time off to develop my other abilities and utilize the four years of my research time fruitfully. So many times, 
it so happens that some student finds that he has got some early success. And then he feels that, you know, I can do many other things, become a secretary of my hostel, right? Do so many things. But then it is important to note, if you lose momentum, it is very difficult to again regain it. Right? It becomes very difficult. So one should not do these kind of things. Another pitfall. In a research program, no one sets your agenda. Everything you do is open-ended. That means you can easily spend too much time on any task you start. Especially if stubborn perfectionism or an inferiority complex leads you to feel that your work is never good enough. Or if you are subconsciously trying to put off that scary next phase of your research. So sometimes there are students, you know, who want things to be done perfectly. So the, you end up spending a lot of time on trying to achieve 100 percent, right, perfection. But actually there is nothing like that. So this is where your guide can help. In fact, these are the places where the guide is really supposed to help. So if the guide tells you, look, don't spend so much time on this, right, you take the advice. So I have discussed this point already and urge to do earth shaking research in PhD. Okay? I am I wasted it under pitfall. So uh, this is to point out the other side of it. I am not trying to say that you know you should not have a desire to do great work. That is not what we are saying. What we are saying is uh, if you find that um, things uh, are not moving very well for you because you have hit upon a very big problem, then you should not get disappointed if you have to water down the thing a little bit. And this is where you, again your guide can help. This is the point that we are trying to make here. We are not quest uh, questioning the urge itself for doing earth shaking research. We are saying that if you want to do it during the PhD itself, it may not happen because it is a time bound program and so on. So you must be aware of these limitations. You can always do great research after your PhD. And finally, taking up a job before thesis submission. See, because as we have listed the psychological phases in which a student undergoes towards the end, you know, you are feeling frustrated and so on and you want to finish it. But sometimes what happens is even before finishing, you take up a job. And you think that, you know, you take up a job and you will go there and, you know, then you will write your thesis. It does not happen like that. So you should complete your thesis. Only after you have submitted your thesis, you should take up a job. Or you plan in such a way that you will submit your thesis before you take up a job, right? So last advice is get started. Early on, carry out a small project with definite deadlines. It is important to get results. The get results is highlighted there. It is important to get results even if not original in the beginning. Getting results even by repeating others' work boosts your self-confidence. So many times students are not willing to do this. Okay? They think they will only work on something original. That is why they have joined research. Yes, that is true. But that is what is the, is the end of the PhD. Right? The ultimate culmination of the PhD is that you would have done original work. But if you want to get started, it is very important to get results in the beginning. So this is important. So during research, the feelings of exploration, excitement, challenge, involvement and passion are frequent and one gets an enormous feeling of achievement on the award of a research degree. Research makes you an independent and organized thinker, a good communicator and stress time manager. So with this quotation, we will end the course. Do not follow where the path may lead, go instead where there is no path. This is what Ralph Emerson said. So that is the spirit of research.